Let me begin my section with what I'm calling a look backward. And I begin with a quotation that has been a moving power for both my wife and me. The children of Zion said, Orson Pratt, love in proportion to the heavenly knowledge which they have received. For love keeps pace with knowledge, and as the one increases, so does the other. And when knowledge is perfected, love will be perfected also. As if to verify that quotation, his brother, Parley P. Pratt, in an autobiographical note about an afternoon he spent with Joseph Smith, said, I had loved before, but I knew not why. Now I loved with a pureness, an intensity of elevated, exalted feeling, which would lift my soul from the transitory things of this groveling sphere and expand it as the ocean. In short, I could now love with the spirit and with the understanding also. Here is his description of the knowledge that came that afternoon. It was at this time that I received from Joseph Smith the first idea of eternal family organization and the eternal union of the sexes in those inexpressibly endearing relationships which none but the highly intellectual, the refined and pure in heart know how to prize and which are at the very foundation of everything worthy to be called happiness. It was from him that I learned that the wife of my bosom might be secured to me for time and all eternity, and that the refined sympathies and affections which endeared us to each other emanated from the fountain of divine, eternal love. It was from him that I learned that we might cultivate these affections and grow and increase in them to all eternity. Well, these quotes teach us that the first crucial insight to the building of a marriage that means something is to keep the vision, and that without the vision, marriage perishes. But again and again we have been asked in seminars, why do you torment us with this celebration of the ideal? How in moments of discouragement can we live when all you do is dangle before us these remote possibilities? Well, our answer is that the truth about our past, as well as our present and future, is so emancipating and so motivating that no other attempt at solving marital conflict can compare. And so we continue to dwell for some time on this gospel framework. Let us begin at the beginning by admitting that there wasn't one. We all know that somehow marriage is of God, that the primal commandment to our first parents was multiply and replenish the earth, that the highest ordinance in the kingdom of God is the sealing of husband and wife. But there is a preface even to this. I quote from James E. Talmadge, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints affirms as reasonable, scriptural, and true the doctrine of the eternity of sex among the children of God. The distinction between male and female is no condition peculiar to the relatively brief period of mortal life. It was an essential characteristic of our pre-existent state, even as it shall continue after death in both the disembodied and resurrected states. The doctrine of pre-existence, says a great statement from the First Presidency, throws a wonderful light upon the otherwise mysterious problem of man's origin. It shows that man as spirit was begotten and born of heavenly parents, 
and reared to maturity in the eternal mansions of the Father prior to coming upon the earth in a temporal body to undergo and experience immortality. The Church proclaims man to be the direct and lineal offspring of deity. All men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother and are literally sons and daughters of deity. Now there is much we don't know about that pre-mortal realm over which a curtain of amnesia has been drawn. But let me share briefly some glimpses from the prophets that are for sure and which bear upon the meaning of family intimacy. Said Joseph Smith, at the great organization in heaven, we were all present. We saw the Savior chosen and appointed and the plan of salvation made, and we sanctioned it. It's not uncommon for teenage children to say to their parents, I did not ask to be born. And the proper answer to that is, if you had, the answer would have been no. No, the answer is, <laughs> oh yes, you did. We all not only asked but prepared, trained, anticipated the opportunities of mortality. Which leads to the second great statement, every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of this world. And I suggest to you that the highest form of ministration is in the family. Was ordained to that very purpose in the Grand Council before this world was. And then this third statement, The Father called all spirits before him at the creation of man and organized them. And he explains in a similar statement, The organization of spiritual and heavenly worlds as of spiritual and heavenly beings was agreeable to the most perfect order and harmony. Their limits and bounds were fixed irrevocably and voluntarily subscribed to in their heavenly estate by themselves and were by our first parents subscribed to on the earth. Hence the importance of embracing and subscribing to principles of eternal truth by all men upon the earth that expect eternal life. Still another expansion says, We are lawful heirs according to the flesh. Blessed are ye if ye continue. Notice that's different than beginning. Blessed are ye if ye continue in my goodness, a light unto the Gentiles and through this priesthood. And priesthood relates to parenthood, and parenthood relates to godhood. Through this priesthood, a Savior unto my family, Israel. When Brigham Young was very preoccupied with the interrelationship of the family and the principle of adoption, he had a revelatory dream. And describing it says the following, Joseph showed me the pattern how they were in the beginning. He's talking about the spirits in the pre-mortal condition. This I cannot describe, but I saw it and saw where the priesthood had been taken from the earth and how it must be joined together so that there would be a perfect chain from Father Adam to his latest posterity. Joseph again said, Tell the people to be sure and keep the Spirit of the Lord and follow it and it will lead them just right. And then this promise. If they will, they will find themselves just as they were organized by our Father in heaven before they came into the world. Our Father in heaven organized the human family, but they are all disorganized and in great confusion. Others of the prophets have spoken of the nostalgia one of our writers has called it celestial homesickness, which we live under as we come into this world and struggle to find ourselves 
and somehow to find a home. Said Orson F. Whitney, for example, we believe that the ties of this world will extend to the next. Why not believe that we had similar ties before we came into this world? Some of them, at least. And in a diary entry, Wilford Woodruff says, Joseph Smith once said something like this, that if the people knew what was behind the veil, they would by every means try to commit suicide, that they might get there. But the Lord in his wisdom had implanted the fear of death in every person that they might cling to life and thus accomplish the designs of their Creator. That is likely the origin of a folklore version of that statement, that if we could see even the glory of the telestial kingdom, we would struggle to get there. What is behind the veil and what we have now forgotten is a family relationship with our eternal Father in the pre-mortal realm. And we could not stand to stay here ten minutes, some have suggested, if we could clearly remember that. But we are intended to stay in order to make possible an eventual glorious reunion. Now, do not misunderstand these quotations. The Church does not teach that, as some put it, all marriages are made in heaven, or that there is a one and one only soulmate. But the Church does teach that we lived in a family relationship to our Father and in relationship to others of His Spirit, sons and daughters, long before we entered this world. And unwanted children and unwanted mates can be evaded, but the teaching of the Church from beginning to end has been that we should honor and seek to magnify those who belong to us in the blood ties of family. Each of the presidents of the Church in turn has said things about sealing and the laws of adoption. When President Wilford Woodruff announced the principle of pursuing one's own lines, he said, have children sealed to their parents and run this chain th through as far as you can get it. This is the will of the Lord to his people. And he added, it is my duty to honor my father who begot me in the flesh. It is your duty to do the same. When you do this, the Spirit of God will be with you. Let us turn now to the roots of family life in one of the great and long-standing traditions of our world. I refer to Judaism and to the glorification of family life, which in its fountainhead is one of the strongest traditions. In the Hebrew language, there is no neuter case. There is no it. Grammatically, everything in the cosmos is either masculine or feminine. Jewish lore teaches that man is one stock. I'm quoting from a Midrash statement. One stock with the divine. And that in all mankind there are divine sparks. One strand of Jewish teaching affirms the reality of what they call the Shekhinah. Early, this was almost synonymous with the glory of God and was thought of in terms of a radiance or an emanation of God. But in subsequent centuries, more and more, the Shekhinah has been spoken of as a maternal counterpart of God. And in some forms of medieval Judaism, it is taught that she is somehow exiled from the divine and that her reunion depends upon the redemption and reunion of all the children of men. In the Midrash, it is taught that Adam was created with two bodies, one of which was pulled away to create Eve. It is not their final separation from each other that will achieve redemption. It is their reunion. 
What has God been doing since creation? <laughs> That's a Talmudic question. Answer. Making marriages. How rare is a good marriage? Answer. As rare as the parting of the Red Sea. <laughs> How important is creation? Answer. Every soul is holy ground. Every man and every woman is an infinity. Why is murder so abhorrent? Answer. If you take a life, you destroy a race. If you save a life, you save a race. Why are Abraham and Sarah to be honored? Because Sarah was promised in the hour of her hopeless barrenness that she would have a son. And by the way, they teach that on the day that son was born, every line in Sarah's aged face disappeared. She was rejuvenated in motherhood. And that from then on, when people asked, How old are you? she dated her age from the birth of Isaac. <laughs> the majesty of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice the only hope he and Sarah had to fulfill divine promise, that he would have a posterity as glorious and not just as numerous as the stars. The majesty, I say, of that sacrifice was such that one tradition says Abraham built an altar more or less on the level, but the sublimity of his willingness was such that God raised that flat land into a mountain, a sacred mountain from then on. For Jewish orthodoxy, and this is a quote, man in celibacy is in sublime ignorance. He does not know what the words good, help, joy, blessing, peace, or expiation of sin mean. He is, in fact, not entitled to the dignified name of man. Interestingly, the high priest, who was to represent all Israel at the Holy of Holies in the Day of Atonement, could only do so if he had a wife. Only if his heart was permeated with the love of wife and children in the home could he, according to Talmudic law, offer up family prayer, for so it is, to the Universal Father, knowing he would be heard. And what does Jewish tradition say of woman? Well, a prior quote from the prophet Joseph, he says the word ruach in Hebrew, which means spirit or breath, applies to Adam appropriately when the phrase is, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. But, said he, when it is to Eve God directs his creative power, the word should be translated lives. In Hebrew, chave, Eve, means life or lives. In Hebrew sources, the woman is glorified in ways that I think no other tradition matches. It is woman's persuasive power, according to the Midrash, that led man out of paradise, and it is woman's light that will bring him back. A father is incomprehensible without a mother. The metaphor of the Sabbath in Judaism is that it is a queen and the queen of the Sabbath is the mother, the bride, the culmination of all of man's aspirations. I'm going now to read four statements that confirm. It is said in the Midrash that at Sinai, women received and accepted the Decalogue before the men. The Hebrew words for man and woman have within them the word Yah, which is a divine name, and this parable summarizes, if a husband 
marries a bad woman, he becomes bad. If a woman marries a bad man, he becomes good. Conclusion, everything depends on the woman. God pairs in marriages, says the, the Midrash, and appoints all destinies. Man is bound to pay the same respect to his wife's father as he would to his own father, and a wife, say they, is like an altar, like the altar in the temple, and she is even an atonement as the altar was. Now all these things point to making the home a sanctuary. And a little farther on, I would like to relate the beautiful teaching of the Restoration that somehow the temple and the home are sanctuaries, one in the image of the other. Now a close-up for a moment of Jesus and the family. Jesus, after all, was a Jew. The teachings, the miracles, the parables are rooted in family consciousness. The most frequent title Jesus uses for the eternal is Father, Abba. And that doesn't really translate correctly. It, Abba does mean Father, but it means something more intimate. It would be more accurate to say that Abba means Daddy. It means the most intimate form of addressing. Remember Jesus on the first occasion of his announcing his own role as the anointed one. It was to a woman. She was a prodigal daughter. She was a despised Samaritan standing by a well. That well, incidentally, was Jacob's well. He himself had taken water from it, so tradition said. And it was in the area of Shechem where Joseph had asked to have his bones brought back for burial. The very heart of the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was symbolized in the well and the tomb. And on that occasion, to a woman, Jesus says, in effect, the water you take from this well will not fully satisfy your thirst. You will thirst again. But the water I have to give is such that you would never thirst. She first felt he was only playing with words, expresses disbelief, but he repeats himself. And finally, she says, Sir, give me this water. And Jesus replies, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The incident doesn't end there, and most who read it pass right over the statement I have just read and assume that Jesus asked her to bring her husband only, as it were, to smoke her out, because what she then says is, I have no husband. And Jesus replies, Thou hast well said, thou hast no husband. For thou hast had several husbands, and he with whom thou art not living is not thy husband. And the woman then replies, I see thou art a prophet. But leave that sequel out and remain only on the phrase, Go call thy husband, and you are seeing a tie in Jesus' thinking between the well of living water, which the gospel is magnificently symbolized in, and eternal family. Go get thy husband. Both in his mortal ministry and in modern scripture, Jesus speaks of himself as the bridegroom. He speaks of the church as a bride adorned for that day when the bridegroom will unveil the heavens and cause the mountains to flow down at his presence. His most earnest plea over and over is that we must abide his law if we are to fulfill celestial purposes. And his law is the law of the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. So there is a passage, some cite that seems to contradict that, 
Remember Mary comes and others, Mary his mother, and he is addressing a group and someone says, your mother uh, is waiting or something of the effect. And he then replies, who is my mother? Who is my brother? And goes on to say, who follows me is. And that passage is taken to mean one must abandon family life in order to be a disciple of Jesus. It can be read to mean exactly the opposite. If you want to know what true disciple of Jesus Christ is, you must understand that you, no matter whether you're an orphan, a stranger, or a distant friend, you are to become his disciple by becoming a member of the eternal family. And he who was only begotten now becomes the only begetter of that family, the church of the firstborn, who will enjoy a fullness of his priesthood, and that means a fullness and a continuation of the power of creation forever. Jesus' miracles are varied, and the question can be asked, what do they have in common? I suggest to you one thing all his miracles have in common is compassion. Every one of them is a manifestation from the very center of his soul of compassion for someone. But if I am not mistaken, the times when he manifests the most profound compassion are when reality has cut across and mutilated genuine family relationships. So, for example, a woman is without issue and he has compassion and heals her. Another is in some kind of continual flow that prevents conception. She is healed. It is often referred to in the incident of healing that the person involved is the only son or the only daughter of the man who's crying for help or the wife or the mother. The cry that made Jesus weep in behalf of Lazarus came from two of his sisters. Nowhere in the New Testament, as I read it, does one find salvation defined as isolating and insulating individuals that they must be saved. Instead, it all points to securing links in the glorified family of which there are many earthly counterparts. I have great respect for the Joseph Smith translation. And remember the first miracle Jesus performed? That's a trick question, which Joseph Smith himself once answered in court. He was asked, what was the first miracle Jesus performed? In the New Testament context, the answer is, at Cana. But what Joseph Smith replied was, he created the earth. In the account of the Cana incident, the way it stands in the King James, Jesus' mother comes and says, we are without sufficient wine. And he replies, and I, in my voice, will describe how I've heard it preached outside this church. Woman, what have I to do with thee? It is, in the language of the 20th century, a put-down. But in the JST, he says, Woman, what wilt thou have me to do for thee? That will I do, for mine hour is not yet come. In both versions, he proceeds to do as she asks, and he made not only wine sufficient for that feast, but a hundred gallons extra. Abundance. Sometimes people classify all that Jesus did in terms of three categories, healings, exorcisms, and in the case of Lazarus, a resuscitation. But all of them, if you look closely, are matters of life and death. And the image that he has repeated throughout all our four standard works makes himself like a mother hen 
How oft, he says, I would have gathered you as a hen gathereth chicks. And in the version in Malachi, which was quoted to Joseph Smith in the initial events of this dispensation, the word son, S-U-N, is combined with son, S-O-N, and it says that in the last days he would arise with healing in his wings. Healing in his wings, or as the Hebrew would have it, in his extremities. Healings, if you will, in his very touch. And there were those who reached out, as did the woman near the Mount of Transfiguration, who received life and light through him. As for the parables, the same undergirding insights, I am the life, I am the true vine, I am the living bread and the living water, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus, in short, just in terms of the New Testament, laid the foundation for eternal family life and love. Let's turn now to an examination briefly of what love may be. The longer I live, the less sure I am as to how to get a final categorical definition of love. But there can be no question as to what it is like and where it comes from. And that is important in this setting. Said Joseph Smith, There is a love from God. Notice, from God. That should be exercised toward those of our faith who walk uprightly, which is peculiar to itself. It's unique. But it is without prejudice. See, the world is full of people. Birds of a feather flock together. There are, there are kinds of honor and kinds of sharing, even called love. But this is a unique kind, centering in God. And it isn't based on prejudice. It also, he says, gives scope to the mind, which enables us to conduct ourselves with greater liberality towards all that are not of our faith than what they exercise towards one another. These principles approximate nearer to the mind of God because it is this love like God or God-like. Now, whatever else love is, <laughs> it is a shining thing. Some time ago, a study group with which I was associated took on the words light and life and love and went through all the scriptures. We learned something. All light, both kinds of light, the kind you and I see coming out of a light bulb and the kind that somehow quickens our intelligence and is subtler, both kinds ultimately, according to the revelations, center in God. But we also learned that in the scriptures, one opposite term for love is darkness. The light that fills the immensity of space is a manifestation of love. Therefore, if, as a modern scripture says, the love of the Father does not continue with us, that does not mean that he withdraws it from us. It means that we in our insensitivity or rebellion or comparative darkness, withdraw from it. If we would increase in love, it follows we must increase in light, and if we would increase in light, that light which groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day, then says the revelation, we are to become servants of all, especially those of our own household. Thus we may become subject to the life and the light the Spirit and the power sent forth by the will of the Father. And that is love. So if love is interrelated with light, can we say it is interrelated with fire? I said so in one of my essays on love, and letters have come to me saying, you're playing with words. This is a metaphor. What do you mean love is fire? Well, let me suggest to you it's not a mere metaphor. We are taught that, as Joseph said, God dwells in everlasting burnings. God dwells in everlasting burnings. Our God, he elsewhere says, quoting Paul, is a consuming fire. Now, strangely, the classical doctrine of hell 
is a doctrine of heat and fire and flame. Mormons have taken the classical doctrine of hell and called it heaven. God dwells in everlasting burnings. The devil dwells in numbing, cold darkness. Those who say it will be a cold day in hell <laughs> are telling the literal truth. <laughs> Said Brigham Young, speaking of the eventual glorification of this earth, this earth will not be an opaque body as it now is. It will be a body of light. God himself will light up the world with his glory, making of it a body more brilliant than the sun that shines in yonder heavens. So when the prophets are trying to describe the love of God, when it fills them, they say things like, The Spirit is fire in our bones, or Nephi. He hath filled me with his love, which he elsewhere calls his power, even unto the consuming of my flesh. When Joseph Smith, in attempting to describe what descended upon him in the sacred grove, was dictating, the first word that came to his mind was fire. That is in the record, and he crossed it out later and wrote the word glory. But the glory he wanted to say, not a hurtful or a glaring glory, but one that filled him with love, did not, and he was surprised at this, consume the trees. And he comments, My soul was filled with love for many days, and I could rejoice with great joy. And the Lord was with me. Now two other points about what love is like. Love, whatever else it is, is self-generating. Virtue cleaveth unto virtue, says modern revelation. I, I submit love cleaveth unto love. As two globes of quicksilver are drawn together, or two candles become one flame, or in the nuclear age, as two <laughs> properly charged atoms. There is a uniting power here that is cosmic as well as personal. But it is also lawful, and that is crucial for us to understand. Most often, things said about romantic love suggest that it is beyond our control, that it comes and goes like the wind, that it is or is not bigger than both of us, etc., the scriptures say, love grows in response to our harmony with law. There are things we can, in fact, do in our own lives, whatever may be the behavior of others, to increase our access to and power to give love. And at the core, at the divine center, to use Steve's phrase, is love. A state president recently reports, that a man came in and said, I have fallen out of love with my wife. And when love is dead, it is really dead. The state president replied, you're out of love. Then you stopped doing the things that generate love. You have lost touch with the source of love. Start over. Man said, I don't have the heart. State president said, you do. If nothing else, you have the skeleton of your original covenant when you were in the full bloom of romantic love. If the flame has diminished, the spark has not. Fan it. In one of our seminars, we asked a sincere couple uh, about their relationship. They had struggled for years and had been childless. And they asked us, as if we could speak for the church, which we can't, what about the relationship of man and woman when it is not creative, when it is not leading to children? They even said they believed that the only divinely approved purpose of man and woman in love is children. We said, you feel this? Yes. You feel your lives are only truly unselfish in the nurturing of your children? Yes. Then I turned to one of them and said, Is your mate a child of God? Yes. 
Don't you think your heavenly parents want him to be fulfilled or her? Don't you think your calling to love begins with him or her and then extends to your offspring? We never thought of it that way. We said, think of it that way. Said Joseph F. Smith, one of our great leaders, God is the author of the love of man and woman, and their relationship is honorable and sanctifying. Another writer, God is the author of conjugal love as he is of all other kinds of love. Such unions, according to modern revelation, are visited with blessings and not cursings, and are attended, quote, with my power, saith the Lord, and are without condemnation in earth and in heaven. Paul has a statement and this is the modified translation of Joseph Smith, as follows, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Then he adds, Depart ye not one from the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. The King James Version simply says, Defraud ye not one the other, which is confusing. Now one other point about love, and this section concludes. One of the strong creedal statements about the nature of God in our history has been that God is without passions. He is passionless. He lives in static, transcendent perfection and has no needs. The Restoration teaches otherwise. Everything in our revelations teach us that God can be pleased or displeased, thwarted or honored and fulfilled, hurt as well as rejoiced. He cares for us as much as he cares for himself and is therefore vulnerable. See, <laughs> I've put it to a few of my students. If you really come to love somebody, then you have doubled your capacity for pain. Because now you care as much about her or him as you earlier cared about yourself. And now, contrary to the condition when you were not involved at all and were splendidly indifferent, every pain as well as every pleasure is yours. It must be rough to be the father of all of us. Paul once said he can be touched, and Joseph Smith testified, is, with the feeling of our infirmities. If this wasn't clear to Joseph Smith in his earliest years, it came down clearly when he was only 25 as he was translating a vision of Enoch and saw through his eyes that the Father, like the Son, can be troubled to tears by our indifference or hostility. Enoch marveled and cried out, having named all the perfections of God, and said, O oh God, how is it that thou canst weep? And the answer came, Unto thy brethren I have said that they should love one another, and that they should choose me their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. I submit it is not blasphemy to say that God needs our love, and the kind of love he most seeks is family love. Love at home is the next section. There are no problemless marriages. We have learned this from interviews with hundreds. 
even the marriages we have admired and held up as a model are, on close examination, struggles. There are difficulties. But we have learned that in those couples that are still growing together, three elements make all the difference. There are many, of course, uh, that may be trivial, but these are the core ones, common elements. First, there is indeed a sense of divine covenant in marriage. Second, there are some moments, and even if they're rare, they can make an awful lot of desert worth it. Some moments when their caring and sharing really comes together, and they have what some would call peak experiences. And third, whatever else they're doing, they're taking some time and giving some energy to make the marriage work. Let me stress the third point with uh, an example or two. I know a couple who are, as the Scripture would put it, unequally yoked. Both have been divorced once. The wife had herself uh, been active in the church most of her life. The husband had been indifferent. And their marriage now, though a high income and to all appearances very happy marriage, was tenuous. Both had thought of separation. After the conversion of the husband, he came to a stark real realization. He used the word revelation. He had given his wife everything he could except himself. He recognized for the first time that he was a kind of loner. He had been trained that way. He had been environmentally influenced that way and that he had been placating rather than cherishing his wife. He now resolved to put her at the heart of his very busy life. And all that really meant in terms of change is lingering in little ways of affection. So he did write a note. He did touch her. He did phone at his own initiative just to find out how she was, not on business. And from that moment, things changed. Their children today say they can sense the tangible love. Another couple, and this is a confidence I have not given the name, an authentic letter. A husband had a serious health problem and for several long weeks was home, almost incapacitated. Listen to the wife's comment. It used to be that John occupied a chair in our home only when he was working on checks or counseling or eating or watching TV. I insisted he might enjoy, uh, if only momentarily, a sound sleep rather than sitting there doing these things. Our moments of communion were so fleeting on the dead run that they were rare. But... Since his illness, we have shared wonderful moments together. I've sat for hours at the side of his bed. There was no need for us to speak. The space between us was empty of words. They were necessary. We have felt together a peace, a companionship that cannot be sandwiched into a few quiet moments of a frantically scheduled life. Someone, by the way, has said there's a real difference between a full life and a hurried existence. I have seen John hold his little daughter for long periods of time in perfect peace and enjoyment. I have seen the child absorb her father's new kind of love and reciprocate in kind. All our family relationships have taken on a new depth because we have been able to share with each other not just more experiences, more understanding. What we have found together is too precious and personal to describe, yet it's something all are entitled to. Why must we wait for a crisis? 
One other example quickly. A mother was trying to teach a neurologically impaired child. He was nine years old. She perpetually failed. One night, on her knees, she cried out, Why? And in her mind, she got this message. What you are saying, in effect, is, I love you, Rob, but I can't accept your actions. And that was coming through to him as rejection. The impression was, Say, I love you, Rob, and I accept you as you are, actions and all. But say it and feel it, was the message. She tried. Here is her description. To my joy, I found I actually could accept Rob, actions and all. I suddenly realized how much more important he was than anything he was doing. On that day, Rob began to change. He felt my love and basked in it. He calmed down and became my most helpful student, always wanting to assist me. He made real progress. His parents came to see me and were thrilled. Well, that's the power of love. Now, may I describe briefly, and this may sound terribly idealistic, I submit to you it is also profoundly realistic, on the outcomes, four of them, of a Christ-like love in the home. If it is there, then, number one, you will have the joy of seeing another person become more and more a son of God. The eight-cow woman in the Johnny Lingo story became an eight-cow woman only when she learned that was how her man felt about her. It was his love that created the beauty in her that no one else could see. It seems a sentimental notion that love is physically transforming, but it is. Who has not seen it? Second, when you give love that way, even in the presence of bitterness and abuse, when you return a look of daggers with a look of love, eventually the recipient will want to give it back. At least that is the best hope you have. In the end, that return wave will enrich you. But the converse is also true. Negative reciprocation, nagging, pleading, sending back as good as you get, denial, distance, playing hard to get, tricks, trades. Uh, these help a marriage backwards. Third, peace. Joseph Smith described some homes of his own time as places of, quote, war, jangle, and contradiction. He said, when asked once, what is a truly illegitimate child? One who has hateful parents who argue and are at variance with each other? Peace comes when you return no evil with evil, when you are patient in the presence of impatience. This removes the strongest self-deception in the home. Namely, it's all somebody else's fault. And fourth, there is a ripple effect. You plant, as it were, the seed in your home, and somehow that influence extends beyond. A city set on a hill, said Joseph Smith, and it could be a home, one only, set on a hill that has the light of that kind of love, cannot be hid. See, we have a form of uh, Urim and Thummim, whereby all things of a lower order are made known to us. It's called television. <laughs> but the power of this kind of love radiates beyond the home. Beyond this time, this place, this circumstance, think of ten generations of children who inherited and transmitted such love, and theirs, and theirs. The world is full of people who talk of empire building. The work of God and His Christ is personality building. 
Anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but who can count the apples in a seed? Just keeping one arm toward our forebears and one arm in the direction of our anticipated posterity may be our mightiest contribution to life. Over the years, I have collected first-hand accounts of couples or families where love, even the minimum that we're trying to reach for, has overcome against incredible odds. The title of the file is Love Finds a Way. Let me give you some examples. Husband 78 has Parkinson's disease with its ceaseless tremor. Wife, two years younger, has arthritis and insomnia. How do such seasoned mates cope? At night, husband places hand under wife's neck while they lie in bed. Hand automatically massages and soothes. Husband prays for her through his mobile laying on of hand. Wife is relieved and falls asleep. Husband falls asleep, shaking ceases. Love finds a way. Example, couple has four children, all normal. After two years, sons develop Hurler's syndrome. This is a reversing of all growth processes. Both children become bedfast. One lives 15 years, the other 21. Each dies when there is not muscle enough left to breathe. In all those years, the mother, keeping constant vigil, hardly leaves the house. Yet this home remains a neighborhood magnet, a healthy, wholesome, resilient place for family and visitors. Why? Because in her words... My husband and I are still a stomach-grabbing pair of romantics. They are and are saints. Example, phone call comes to Temple President. We wish to have our three adopted children sealed to us. That will be fine. Arrangements are made. Next day, matron of the temple enters the nursery. Here are three radically affected Down syndrome children. Each has been plucked from a different foundling home or hospital. We were unable to have children, the couple explains. We love them as our own. Example. Wife and daughter of a recent convert are driving, rejoicing. Another car careens from the opposite lane into a head-on collision. Mother and daughter are killed. The other driver is thoroughly drunk celebrating the birth of his first child. He walks away unscratched. At home, the bereaved husband, after some days, becomes aware that one person in the world is suffering more than he. He drives to the young man's home, knocks on the door, confronts surprise and recoil with two quiet sentences. Do not be afraid. I have come to tell you I forgive you. Example, wheelchaired spastics meet, fall in love, and are married in the temple. <laughs> Years later, husband phones bishop. I took Mary to the hospital to have surgery for a tumor. They delivered a seven-pound, eight-ounce boy. <laughs> love finds a way. Example, wife of general authority suffers stroke. For five years she is confined to bed, in the last year unable to speak. Husband moves her bed into the living room, surrounds her with bustling life, speaks to her in all their inside jokes and code phrases and love pats. She can only reply with her eyes. Visitors say, How can one think evil? of a gospel which has created a face like that. Example, a dedicated nun is converted. First, to the holiness of marriage. Second, to the vitality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And third, to the proposal of a Latter-day Saint widower. 
After some years of senior citizen marriage, she bears her testimony, saying, I love his first wife as I love him. Example, renowned sociologist retires at 65. At home, he and his wife hold long discussions. What's the greatest contribution we can make in our remaining years? Decision to raise a child in love in the pattern of Christ. They go to adoption agencies. They are ridiculed brutally. Your age? No way. After 26 official refusals, much fasting and prayer, and infinite red tape, they are permitted to adopt for the first time in America an orphan boy from the Far East. Example, six-year-old daughter ventures into neighbor's yard and darts on her blind side into a man in a rotary lawnmower. Later, her parents stand over her in the intensive care unit, try to decide how to tell her her foot is amputated. She feels their anxiety, reads the message, and says, It's all right, Mother. I won't need two feet to love my children, only two arms. For example, Sister Zina follows Sister Eliza from a meeting and says, Sister so-and-so sent me to tell you that she doesn't love you anymore. But, Eliza replies, I love her. Nothing she can say or do can change that. Example, wife says to the acid comment of a young lady who calls her a church widow, I could not love my husband if I did not know his soul is as broad as eternity. Example, lady missionary comes from a broken home, serves in the mission field, returns home in the fear that she will be like her alcoholic mother. Marriage prospects fade. She is counseled, if you need a friend, be a friend. If you cannot channel your affectionate gifts in marriage, channel them in service. She discovers a talent for communicating with retarded children. Long years later, she finds that others have discovered in her a more lovable person including a man who wants to become her husband. Example, hemophiliac in braces is called on a mission. His present doesn't mollycoddle him, but presses him to the limits. He serves well, becomes rooted in the scriptures, marries in the faith that his pain and problem, which eventually requires 3,200 blood transfusions. Will not be visited on his children. It isn't. The marriage survives as partners almost reverse roles. Wife, breadwinner in a hard role outside the home. Husband hobbles around. House keeps. Works one day and three. Keeps shop. Their home is a haven. Example, woman in mid-thirties, paralyzed from the waist down. Husband already unfaithful, hopes for her death. Long therapy and great faith enable her to function again from a wheelchair. Then her husband abandons her. She raises her children single and single-handedly, finds her niche in the church as a youth leader, and though the absence of the priesthood in her home is a penalty, it is made up by solicitous brethren in the ward and stake. Not a trace of bitterness shows in her face. And now a word about finding meaning in suffering which, if we don't, we may find ourselves unable to cope with marriage. Hugh Nibley has uncovered the following quotation from an apocryphal source. It claims to be an echo of the words of Christ, quote, If you knew how to suffer, you would be able not to suffer. Learn how to suffer, and you should be able not to suffer. A renowned Center for Patients with Chronic Pain is headed by a recent convert of the Church. His name, I reserve, he's a neurosurgeon. He heads a pain team who deal with patients who have been unable through any method to reduce their pain. Reading a line in one of my essays which says, In us and in others, love is the Lord's preventive medicine, 
And as we are now learning the only foundation for powerful therapy, this man says, We have found that unless there is a significant other in the life of the sufferer, at least one person who cares about him and about whom he cares, all our efforts to diminish pain are weak. On the other hand, if there is a significant other, a person who cares, the sufferer is much better able to endure and overcome. Scientific Confirmation of the New Testament There is an ancient tradition that the same Hebrew letters that mean anguish, tsara, also spell another word which means light, tsohar. It is the calling of the faithful to find the light of meaning in suffering. Pain need not be just absurd and pointless and mindless. Our sufferings can, through Christ, be turned to good. We can generate light out of anguish. Men have to suffer. The prophet Joseph once said that they may come up upon Mount Zion and be exalted above the heavens. There are apparently no celestial personalities except those who have known affliction and known it by experience. This does not mean that we seek pain. It means that we bear the pains that our life missions and our family responsibilities require us to bear. Said Brigham, I never felt the peace and power of the Almighty more copiously poured upon me than in the keenest part of our trials. He's talking about the driving persecutions and then about the exodus. They appeared nothing to me. He elsewhere says that you read the story now as a spectator and wince and say, I couldn't have done it. But his whole point is, in the situation itself, the power was such they did do it, and it was not unbearable. The feeling of, I want out, is often accompanied by a feeling of, I am being held back. Yet some of our most vital growth occurs when we are in crisis. Again and again we see this in church history. Joseph Smith's soul growth was in some respects greatest during the period when he was totally denied freedom in a jail ironically called liberty. We spend tremendous energy defending our rights to freedom from things, freedom from interference, from red tape, from rules, from threats, from acts, all of which leaves out of account freedom for, freedom for becoming what we have it in us to become. One can have precious little freedom from and great freedom for. Of course, it is not easy. Of course, we shrink. Of course, we cry out, as did Joseph, How long, O Lord? But to us as to him, the Lord replies, If thou endure it well, thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. The Lord defines that small moment, incidentally. In Joseph's case, it was five years. Thine afflictions shall be but a small moment, and then... God shall exalt thee on high. The temple and the home. In the century and a half since the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, a great heritage has grown in our midst. We are counseled over and over that our understanding of the holy sanctuary depends upon us, upon our probing, our preparation, our prayer. We are taught to seek divine assurance. Yet from those who have gone before, one can distill ten basic purposes of the temple, and each ties intimately to the transformation of our families and our homes. First, the temple is a conservator, said John A. Witso, of the great truths of the gospel. It is so packed with these riches that only a fool would attempt to unravel it in prosaic statement. No one can come out of the temple, endowed as he should be, unless he has seen beyond the symbols to the mighty realities. 
These hidden treasures are reserved for the faithful and can be known, as President Lee testified, in the heart as well as in the head. Joseph taught that these principles are governed by the principle of revelation, but that even the weakest of the saints may receive them as soon as they are prepared. What emerges is wisdom, and wisdom is knowledge applied to our hardest decisions. Our hardest decisions are often at home. Second, the temple is a kind of observatory. Hugh Nibley has written, It is designedly built four square by the compass, a place designed in its very architecture to enable us to get our bearings. Now we may say, but I have them, I understand now the overall directions. But we often in the traveling of life, so often, it's sometimes intimidating, lose our bearings, and to return to the temple is to go back, find ourselves, and as George F. Richards once said, recover the measuring rod to find our way through the struggles of our mortal journey. Third, the temple is called a house of prayer, indeed of fasting and prayer, and for the offering up of your most holy desires unto me. No desire is more holy than family desire. It is a place to bring our perplexities and needs, like the malignant demon of which Christ spoke as he descended from the mount. Some of our weak and sinful habits are of the kind that can only be overcome through prayer and fasting. I would rather go there, said one of our brethren, meaning the temple, to solve the problems that afflict me in life than anywhere else. And Elder Melvin J. Ballard said, When in the sacred walls of these buildings, while you are entitled to the Spirit of the Lord and in the silent moments, the answer will come. For temples are places of covenant and of promise, out of which can come discernment. The Lord refers to a temple as a sanctuary where he may endow with power from on high. Said Brother Widso, the temples therefore give us a power based on enlarged intelligence, a power from on high, of equality with God's own power. And said Joseph Smith, in order that we may be prepared and able to overcome all things. I pause to say that we can and must overcome some things and other things in our lives we must simply endure. And even to discern which is which is one of the great gifts of temple worship. The ordinances are calculated, said again the prophet Joseph, to unite our hearts that we may be one in feeling and sentiment. It is by union of feeling that we obtain power with the heavens. The covenants confer upon us a kind of armor which, as Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, the man who goes to the temple does not have. The temple is a kind of fortress, therefore. In it we withdraw from the world, but then we ourselves are fortified to return to the struggle. Five, temples are places of nourishment. From the days of the ancient temple of Solomon, the temple has been thought upon as a navel of the universe, as a link with all creative powers. Joseph prayed at Kirtland that the temple would enable us to grow up in thee, meaning the Lord God, our Father, and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost and be organized according to thy laws and be prepared to obtain every needful thing. That growing up centers in him who is the life, and he has promised, I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. Six, the temple is the house of the Lord, into which the pure in heart are beckoned that they may see God. It is a great promise, says John A. Whitsaw, to, to the temples God will come. What does this promised communion mean? Does it mean that once in a while the Lord may come into the temples and that once in a while the pure in heart may see or does it mean the larger thing, that the pure in heart who go 
into the temples may there, by the Spirit of God, always have a wonderfully rich communion with God. I think that is what it means to me and to you and to most of us. A temple is a place of revelation. Seven, temples are, as Elder Joseph Fielding Smith again has written, places of sanctification. Go to and finish the temple, and God will fill it with power, said the prophet Joseph Smith. The privilege of the temple is not just to receive the priesthood, but to receive knowledge of the priesthood and from the priesthood. And then, according to the promise, we are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of our bodies. No other church requirement, Brother Witso said, lifts a man or a woman to a nearer likeness of the Lord. Eight, the endowment was, according to Joseph Smith, to prepare the disciples for their missions in the world, that from this place they may bear exceedingly great and glorious tidings. Well, we think of that as a missionary promise, and it is, but it clearly includes taking the gospel home. We should carry the spirit of the temple into our homes to qualify and intensify our efforts, to grasp at teaching moments with our children and with each other, in theory, in principle, and in doctrine. The temple is described, number nine, as a place of thanksgiving, a place to give thanks unto God in the Spirit for whatsoever blessing you're blessed you with. It's a place where, in revealing the ordinances, the Lord will grant us glimpses of things hid from before the foundation of the world. And these, he promises, will bring joy, joy and life eternal. And finally, the temple is a place of unifying all of the ordinances of the gospel in a first-hand participation. Said Joseph, reading the experience of others can never give us a comprehensive view of our condition. Knowledge of these things can only be obtained by and I italicize this phrase, experience through the ordinances of God set forth for that purpose. The ordinances write the law of God into our very inward parts, and our eye becomes single to the glory of God. Our history, like our doctrine, is full of testimony that a temple sacrificially built and faithfully dedicated will bring down the Lord's glory. And the same principle of dedication was followed by the first generation of our saints at home. President Lee was once asked, if a couple is not prepared to be married in the temple, where should they be married? Some said a chapel, some said a cultural hall, some said the local hall of justice, some said elope. But the Lee replied, no, in the home. Next to the temple, the home is the most sacred place on earth. After cleaning and ordering their homes, even their hovels, our forebears dedicated them as a fresh beginning. They consecrated their houses to the family purpose and dwelt upon the faith and confidence of the priesthood. The act was a symbol and also in spirit a returning of all to the Lord. Joseph Smith himself gathered his family together in a modest log cabin in Nauvoo and dedicated it. Even if you have to live in a tent in a vacant lot, President Kimball has said, look upon your home as a sanctuary. One couple I know remove their shoes before entering their own room. The words, a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God, apply to the home. But you will say, how can this be when the home is also a place of hard, sweaty work, a place of fun, a place of jokes and hilarity, a place where we see the whole world through television? The answer is, people who enter a home thus dedicated are constrained to acknowledge that the Lord's Spirit is there. Elder George Q. Cannon once said, Only when such homes dot the landscape will we be prepared for the millennium. Only when there is a far-flung community worldwide which by its very existence removes the curse of blight on the earth will the human family be leavened with peace and therefore prepared for the millennium. As Hugh B. Brown sums it up, 
celestial marriage enables worthy parents to perform a transcendently beautiful and vital service as priest and priestess in the temple of the home. This training will help to prepare them for the exalted position of king and queen in the world to come, where they may reign over their posterity in an ever-expanding kingdom. We speak now briefly about the relationship to church and family callings. Many a man and woman has aspired to office in the modern church, and often such persons feel passed over, left to themselves. They say in their most extreme moments, uh, I am left to the depressing tasks of dishes, diapers, and drudgery. Why doesn't the church use me? The truth on this is in a marvelous quotation from President Lorenzo Snow. I quote, The glorious opportunity of becoming truly great belongs to every faithful elder in Israel. I should say every faithful person in Israel. It is his by right divine, and he will not have to come before this and he's referring to the Twelve, or any other quorum, to have his status defined. He may become like his father, doing works which his father did before him, and he cannot be deprived of the opportunity of reaching this exalted state. This truth came to Lorenzo Snow, he says, with power. Nothing was ever revealed more distinctly than that was to me, he later wrote. I never sought to be a seventy or high priest because this eternal principle was revealed to me long before I was ordained to the priesthood. The position which I now occupy, and he was then president of the church, is nothing compared to what I expect to occupy in the future. Now we may think it's an achievement to hold high office, to sit on the stand, to wear the badge. But that is a temporary office in a temporary organization. Our destiny is not so fragile. The family does not exist to glorify the Church. It is precisely the reverse. The Church is the instrument for the glorification of the family. The priesthood itself and all of its opportunities for service in the wider Church family culminates in a patriarchal priesthood a fatherly priesthood. And this priesthood in its fullness leads to glories compared to which any role in the Church fades into final insignificance. Family exaltation transcends them as the airplane transcends the bumblebee. Lorenzo Snow also said, This thought, and he's talking about the thought that comes when you recognize you are in the image of God the Father, this thought in the breasts of men filled with the light of the Holy Spirit tends to purify them and cleanse them from every ambitious or improper feeling. Family exaltation is not, as one perceptive non-Mormon writer has said, a Führer principle. This is not a quest to be an Adolf Hitler. It is not, in the words of Elder Charles Penrose, man's attempt to dethrone God. It is instead God's gloriously unselfish attempt to exalt man into his full likeness, sharing all that he has and all that he is, and sharing the burden of the whole eternal family, serving and loving each other in order to bring forth more love. We're created, said Brigham Young, for the express purpose of increase. There are none correctly organized but can increase from birth to old age. What is there that is not ordained after an eternal law of existence? It is the deity within us that causes increase. Does this idea startle you? Are you ready to exclaim, What? The Supreme in us? Yes. Still quoting Brigham, He is in every person upon the face of the earth. 
the elements that every individual is made of and lives in, possess the Godhead. This you cannot now understand, but you will hereafter. The deity within us is the great principle that causes us to increase and to grow in grace and truth. Now, what of woman? Let me cite Elder James E. Talmadge on the eventual oneness of those of us who fill the measure of our creation. In the restored Church of Jesus Christ, he says, the holy priesthood is conferred as an individual bestowal upon men only, and this in accordance with the divine requirement. It is not given to women to exercise the authority of the priesthood independently. Nevertheless, in the sacred endowments associated with the ordinances pertaining to the house of the Lord, Woman shares with man the blessings of the priesthood. When the frailties and imperfections of mortality are left behind in the glorified state of the blessed hereafter, husband and wife will administer in their respective stations, seeing and understanding alike, and cooperating to the full in the government of their family kingdom. Then shall woman be recompensed in rich measure for all the injustice that womanhood has endured in mortality. Then shall woman reign by divine right, a queen in the resplendent realm of her glorified state, even as exalted man shall stand priest and king unto the Most High God. Mortal eye cannot see nor mind comprehend the beauty, glory, and majesty of a righteous woman made perfect in the celestial kingdom of God. Melvin J. Ballard summarizes, There are no heights to which man shall aspire and obtain, in which woman shall not be side by side with him. Recently a man dragged his wife into a state president's office, pushed her in a chair, and said, Now, President, you tell my wife to obey my priesthood. <laughs> then all our problems at home will be solved. The President opened the Doctrine and Covenants to Section 121. He looked in the man's eyes and said, According to what I read here, you have no priesthood. President Spencer W. Kimball has said that the word rule in the scripture that says, Thy husband shall rule over thee, is not to be read dominate or force. It should instead be translated preside. Indeed, it was his grandfather, Heber C. Kimball, long before the exploitation of women had become a political issue, who said, No woman can be saved who is ruled by a man and vice versa. We are to be ruled by only one, God. And he rules in the power and in the manner of the priesthood. That is, in a long-suffering, universal sharing of both privilege and accountability. Husbands and wives are each other's counselors. Decisions made in unity are promised greater strength and divine sanction than others. Be agreed as touching all things ye shall ask, is the scriptural admonition most powerful in the home. Conduct of marriage and the government of the home is rooted in this principle. All members of the family are to have input. The question should not just be, what do you think about this, but how do you feel about it? And Brother Covey's win-win approach, which you will hear of later, is simply this. It works. We have observed in the home and even in other efficiency-minded organizations that a concern to get through an agenda without the exchange of honest personal feelings is in the end not more but less effective. Husbands, love your wives, said Paul, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Giving oneself is the reverse 
of the world's definition of power. Sooner or later, our covenants to love our companions will include the requirement to serve and to sacrifice. But if this is said to alert men, husbands and fathers, about the corruptions of power, the same goes for the woman. Power struggles can corrode a woman as they can a man. They can distort her own ministrations in the family, in the relationship with her husband, and in the world. The powers of heaven are available to her only when she, too, seeks to replace coercion with persuasion, impatience with long-suffering, harsh words with gentle ones, haughty judgment with gracious meekness, and manipulative love with the genuine article, love unfeigned. These fruits of the Spirit enlarge the soul, and their counterparts shrink and shrivel it. Lorenzo Snow, who observed one such glorious woman, exclaimed, A mother who has brought up a family of faithful children ought to be saved if she never does another thing. A word now about gathering honey. Psychologists sometimes differ on whether love flourishes most with togetherness, which can sometimes become suffocating, or apartness, which can sometimes be debilitating. The gospel teaches that there are times for intensive care and times for some distance, and that each of us needs some individual private paths for our own rejuvenating solitude. A marriage that does not have some balance on this will be a marriage in trouble. I know a man who says he resisted release from his church calling because he said, when I come home from our prayer meetings and other assignments, I have a spirit which my wife recognizes, and she responds in kind. There is a tangible mantle that accompanies my church service, and that mantle has been a boon to our home and our relationship. That is what I call gathering honey and bringing it home. The late Elder Richard L. Evans quipped that he felt homesick on the way to the airport, <laughs> outbound, but that coming home almost made the departure worth it. But what if the departures are so draining and exhausting and demanding that what comes home is a hulk? hardly a social mate, then there must be rejuvenation, there must be pacing, and there must be a place for the balanced staff. We turn now to a glimpse from the gospel of the very nature of the self, which is itself interrelated with the nature of marriage. It is usual even in a sophisticated age such as our own, where we have much fallout from psychological theory, it is usual to say that you have two sets of impulses in your nature, one good, one evil. You have impulses to love, to help, to cooperate, to forbear, etc. But then there is the other set, ferocious impulses, anger, hate, vice, lust, etc., as I understand the Restoration, it teaches that our nature is at root one. Modern prophets have taught that our entire collection of impulses have or can have a legitimate, goodly, even godly expression. Writes Parley P. Pratt, Some persons have supposed that our natural affections were the results of a fallen and corrupt nature and that they are, quote, carnal, sensual, and devilish, quote, and therefore ought to be resisted, subdued, or overcome, as so many evils which prevent our perfection or progress in the spiritual life. In short, they should be greatly subdued in this world and in the world to come, entirely done away. So far from this being the case, our natural affections are planted in us by the Spirit of God for a wise purpose, and they are the very mainsprings of life and happiness. They are the cement 
of all virtuous and heavenly society. They are the essence of charity or love, and therefore never fail, but endure forever. There is not a more pure and holy principle in existence than the affection which glows in the bosom of a virtuous man for his companion, for his parents, brothers, sisters, and children. If there is one scene in heaven or on earth capable of calling forth the most refined sensibilities of our nature, it is the expressions of love which kindle into rapture and which flow out of the soul of a woman toward her infant. What then is sinful? I answer. Our unnatural passions and affections, or in other words, the abuse, the perversion, the unlawful indulgence of that which is otherwise good. Sodom was not destroyed for their natural affections, but for the want of them. They had perverted all their affections and had given place to that which was unnatural and contrary to nature. Thus they had lost those holy and pure principles of virtue and love which were calculated to preserve and exalt. Evil, in short, and this is a quotation from Brigham Young, is inverted good. But it can be asked, do we really have control of our feelings? How free is free? Our cultures, our ordinary language, our whole way of thinking is loaded with assumptions that feelings are caused from the outside. We think the choice is not between man and mouse, but between man and billiard ball. You make me so mad, we say. You make me so mad. You made me do it. You are my problem. When you change, I'll change. And we usually add, and not before. But the gospel teaches us that we are co-hyphen causes in a universe of cause and effect. The first step in solving any problem in marriage is to accept that the problem is yours, that you can change before your partner. The vital difference between reacting as a billiard ball and responding as a child of God is freedom. It's occurred to me, by the way, that freedom can be defined as the difference between a wink and a blink. All of us know the difference. You blink when someone thrusts a hand close or when a foreign object approaches your eye. Almost involuntarily, you blink. But a wink is voluntary. And ask any girl if she knows the difference. <laughs> Behold, says the Revelation, here is the agency of man. That which is from the beginning is plainly manifest unto them, and they receive not the lights. We have from the beginning had the power of responding instead of reacting. And by our abuse of our freedom, we can diminish it. But by our honoring our power of freedom, in harmony with law, we can increase our freedom into the very likeness of God's freedom. So when someone asks, why did you do it? We usually have an answer. I couldn't help it. This or that arose. This or that was the cause. The ultimate answer? Because I chose. But then someone can say, but why did you choose? And the ultimate answer to that is because I chose. Equipped with this rationale, or the reversal of it, some slip into what I call the chain of blame. When a son comes home with a very bad report card and says, which do you think it is, Dad, heredity or environment? <laughs> the proper answer is there is a third explanation. Whatever influences may have come to us from our backgrounds and our chromosomes, we are nevertheless in charge of how we respond to them. And we must not ever escape that self-accountability. We can help in a great measure what we do and therefore have been commanded to. Now, coming from that point to a question of selfishness, 
Over and over, it has been said by our modern leaders that this seems to be the fundamental problem in marriage. Even in the best Latter-day Saint marriages, selfishness, a concern to get what we can get of happiness in defiance of concern for the happiness of others. In the world at large, we are told today that we're to do our thing, blow our mind, toot our horn, clamor for our rights, and show contempt for anyone or anything that gets in the way. Some psychologists talk about frustrated entitlements, the notion being that you know you are entitled to better, not just that you want it and are frustrated. You're entitled to it. You deserve it. You're not getting it. What then? Well, break out, move on, and ignore the wreckage you leave behind. But the word of the prophets tells us otherwise. They tell us that that mode is the way of bitterness, and it leads to the diminution of life and love, and eventually to great disappointment and even damnation. When the Prophet Joseph Smith was asked about self-aggrandizement, he gave a masterful answer, parallel to that of Jesus, who said, He that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel's shall find it. Said Joseph, Some people entirely denounce the principle of self-aggrandizement as wrong, but it is a correct principle. It may be indulged upon only one rule or plan. Now listen. That is to elevate, benefit, and bless others first. And the workshop, brothers and sisters, for that uh, is the home. First, middle, and end, it's the home. If you will elevate others, the very work itself will exalt you. Upon no other plan can a man, and I will add woman, justly and permanently aggrandize himself. That way of saying it tells us that apparently unjustly and temporarily a person can indeed aggrandize, gratify, satisfy himself, but not in the long run. That, I submit, is an eternal law. When students say to me, do you believe there is any law, any principle in morality that is absolute? I answer yes. And they say, ah, but the absolute is obsolete. This absolute is not obsolete. You will fail, the law says, ultimately, if you seek your own gratification in indifference to or at the expense of others. That is the mode of the adversary, and he seeks to make all men miserable like himself, for misery is the consequence. But the Christ-like mode is to care so much about others that you prefer to suffer rather than that they should, and that exalts. We have here the self-fulfillment that emerges from that kind of selflessness. And I believe with Joseph Smith that God himself aggrandizes his kingdom because he cares as much to magnify and increase our joy as he cares about his own and has mastered the principles whereby it can be done. There is, in short, a form of divine selfishness that leads to the highest of self-fulfillment. I speak for a few moments of what I would call the real family. Only in our generation has the principle emerged that the word family means, at most, two generations. If you bring your family to a gathering, you bring your own children, and maybe maybe your parents. The late Elder LeGrand Richards attended the 50th wedding anniversary of his daughter. How would you like that? Just invite the folks over for our 50th wedding anniversary. He was then 96. 
What before our time was widely understood is that the family is at least four generations plus the Rudich family that reaches in an exponential way into the remote past. The decline of that wider vision has been attemptedly replaced and reversed by the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the children to, and I will add a word, all the fathers and all the mothers, instead of limiting our relationship under the word family to this confining here and now. A Jewish legend says that Elijah will one day help children who have been brought into the presence of God persuade God. How? Well, the children, some of whom will have been killed by their parents or neglected or beaten or aborted, will, of course, as the victims of their parents, be given glory. But what of their parents? Elijah will tell the children, Go to God and say to Him, Is not the measure of good the mercy of God? Is that not larger than the measure of chastisements? If then we died for the sins of our fathers, should they not now for our sakes be granted the good and be permitted to join us in paradise? God will assent to their pleadings, and thus Elijah will have fulfilled the word of the prophet Malachi. He will have brought back the fathers to the children. That's a legend, but the spirit of it is correct. Said Joseph, the spirit of Elijah is that degree of power which holds the sealing power of the kingdom to seal the hearts of the fathers to the children and of the children to their fathers, not only on earth but in heaven, both the living and the dead to each other. It is not as individuals in solitary splendor that we come to such levels of sealing. We will one day sing, we are told, a hymn at the second coming of Christ, including these words, The Lord hath brought again Zion. The Lord hath redeemed his people Israel. According to the election of grace, which was brought to pass by the faith and covenant of their fathers. Our fathers have done for us what we could not do, and we now are to act for them. In so doing, we become, as the Scripture has it, saviors on Mount Zion. Whether from our vantage point or not, this is clear. The prophet Joseph taught us that the veil, and a thin one often, only separates us from those who are not dead at all but more alive than we. Said he, the heavenly priesthood are not idle spectators. We may look for angels and receive their ministrations. We may come to the spirits of just men made perfect. It is our privilege to pray for and obtain these things. We underestimate, I believe, the enduring influence of those beyond. And I mention two examples. Elder John A. Witzow records impressive experiences of his life in the temple in sealing sessions. He had been promised as a boy that he would have great faith in the ordinances of the Lord's house. Bereaved in the untimely deaths of several of his children, he had made a covenant to give his family time to the youth of the church, and his writings were a tithe of his time, 10% of his time, to the youth of the church, and thus made up for the deprivation of his immediate family. He says in his book that the sealing ceremony was to him the most impressive experience in the temple. Years after his wife Zina died, Orson F. Whitney felt one evening a soft and gentle touch, then saw her. She was hovering over me, he said. It was real. I could not doubt she was actually there. When Jedediah M. Grant was given his glimpse of the next sphere, and his description, by the way, is similar almost to the last detail, to certain so-called near-death experiences now being written about in books like Life After Life, 
he saw that the spirit world was a place of great order and harmony and that its order was organization in family capacities. He also beheld that some members of some families were not permitted to dwell together because, quote, they had not honored their callings here. So keen was the impress of this that he asked to return to report and reinforce this to his children. They thought perhaps he was hallucinating. But it had so impressed him, and indelibly, that we cannot cease caring when we pass through the veil, and that if anything, as Joseph summarized, they, speaking of our forebears, their bowels yearn over us. There are lonely and estranged parents, or those who were denied the scope of family life here, who wonder about this condition. They can be heartened by the testimony of modern prophets. They may be surrogate parents, they may reach out to others, and they will have the same eventual blessedness as do first-hand flesh-and-blood parents. The prophet Joseph once said to an, a father who had had no children and with his wife had adopted a little boy, in effect, your love and nurture will eventually result in that child's being as if your own flesh and blood. It is common to think that these accounts are but wishful thinking, but reality is what is real, and relationships are real, and these experiences are the results of the kind of relationship all of us are commanded to live. And now by way of summary, little things destroy the vines, say the prophets. It is the small things sometimes that become the big things in marriage. It is crucial as we are afflicted by the little things, and our generation has a word for it, the things that bug us. It is essential, I repeat, that we have a sense of humor. My own father taught me early in life this story, that when Adam and Eve were about to descend into the mists to begin the vanguard movement of pioneering the earth, Somebody said goodbye, and somebody embraced them, but as they turned away, the father, knowing what they were facing, couldn't stand it. He called them back and gave them a sense of humor. Our history as a people is replete with magnificent examples of men and women, Joseph Smith preeminent, who could move from being playful and cheerful in the midst of affliction to being inspired and attuned to heaven. I have witnessed, for example, the life of the late President Hubie Brown, who, faltering on his 90-year-old legs, was approached by a sympathetic elder packer who said, May I be your cane? And as he extended his arm, President Brown replied, Yes, if I am able. Coming in firm and weak down the aisle of a chapel, he was approached by a little old lady who burst out, Oh, President Brown, I've always wanted you to speak at my funeral. Sister, he replied, if you want me to speak at your funeral, you'd better hurry. <laughs> there was a serious moment when after his stroke, his family surrounded his bed expecting, as the doctor predicted, he would not make it through the night. But early in the morning he rallied, one eye half opened and slowly surveyed the anxious faces. A slight twist showed in the corner of his lips as he said, I fooled you. <laughs> there is a connection between deep spirituality and a delicate sense of humor. If you can laugh at yourself, I'm not speaking here of the humor that hurts, the humor that is a weapon. If you can laugh at yourself and let your companion share in the laughter at yourself, you will get past the little things in great style. President Spencer W. Kimball, in talking about dealing with conflict, has drawn two overlapping circles, but they don't totally overlap. Where they overlap, he says, is the area of unity and harmony and kinship in his marriage. But there is an area of difference on his side of the circle and an area of difference on his wife's side, and they came to define those as the no man's or no woman's lands in their marriage. 
and did not magnify the differences but instead cultivated the harmonies. Candidly, as we have traveled and asked people to list their difficulties, they have wanted a catalog. And when we've asked them to list the positive things they could say, they often needed only a three-by-five card. Some marriage counselors refuse to counsel such couples until they have spent at least two weeks talking about nothing but the things they admire, approve, and enjoy in their companions. We need to recognize that the dissolution or solution of problems sometimes is simply the focusing on what is genuinely shared. And that leads to the gospel principle we are most glib in defending and most remiss in living. I refer to forgiveness. One of the most forgiving men I know, a man named Reed Bradford, has said to me, forgiveness is not hard at all once you really have the Spirit of Christ. But there is the rub. The Lord gave us a revelation on how to forgive. It is, pray for your enemies. Notice, he does not say, pray against your enemies. Pray for. How can you kneel down and pray for someone you were just shouting at in wrath? That's the secret. When someone treats you like dirt, your obligation is to treat them like gold. After praying for, as the Master admonishes, their good. In a celebrated but misnamed film, the closing line is, love means not having to say you're sorry. I submit the truth is exactly the opposite. In a genuine, loving relationship, it may go without saying that you are sorry, but if you truly love your companion, you will say it and forgive. The father of us all, so the prophet knew by vision, forbears, persists in mercy, and according to another vision is gracious and merciful and will turn away his wrath when he looks upon the face of his anointed. When he, in short, is aware as father of how much Christ suffered for us and how much he paid for our birth into his kingdom, he will have mercy as a little child. My own grandfather, who refused to forgive a man, on the ground that what he had done had so slandered the church and so hurt many others, was told again and again by the president of the church, we will take your word for that, Heber, but others of the brethren are ready now for this man to be rebaptized. He refused, but went home after such a meeting one day, read the Doctrine and Covenants by accident, or was it where it says, I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all. He slammed the book and said, If the devil himself repents, I'll baptize him. <laughs> he went back to the president and said he had changed his mind. The president was so pleased, he laughed like a bowl of jelly and then said, Heber, tell me, what was it? And he explained the scripture. Then he said, Now, when you left this morning, how did you feel about that, brother? I felt, he said, like I wanted to go out and smack him down. How do you feel now? He thought a moment and said, to tell the truth, I hope the Lord will forgive the man. Yes, Heber, now you have the Spirit of Christ. This morning you did not. Brothers and sisters, before final rupture, forgive. Even in and during rupture, forgive. For that is the law of Christ, and the poison that results when you don't cannot be but an enemy to your life and your love. When Heber C. Kimball received a love letter from his wife as he began his eighth mission, and she spoke of their sealing being fixed and firm as a decree which is unalterable, he wrote this reply, O oh God! Wilt thou bless her with peace 
and with a long life. And when thou shalt see fit to take her, let thy servant go with her, that no power shall ever separate us from each other. For thou, O God, knowest we love each other with pure hearts. Still, we're willing to leave each other from time to time to preach thy word to the children of men. But now, O God, hear thy servant. Let us have the desires of our hearts, for we want to live together and die and be buried and rise and reign together in thy kingdom with our dear children. The last prophecy Heber C. Kimball uttered was as he walked behind the coffin of his village. He said, I shall not be long after her. And he was not. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. The world seeks peace in barricades, in bombs, and in returning measure for measure. But the most mighty change that can occur in the entire universe is the changing of hearts in their losing the desire for vengeance. In the ashes of our anger, Jesus Christ has promised us peace. And so I conclude of marriage and the home, as of all other aspects of life, the prayer offered of the man who had witnessed the calming of the waves. So when our lives are clouded o'er, and storm winds drift us from the shore, say lest we sink to rise no more. Peace. Be still. <laughs>